All right, so, so you are able to walk better in a victorious style. Hey, Brother Bowman. Uh, so you can walk better in a victorious style. The Lord desires for us to learn how to do the best that we can with the resources that we can. Um, the Lord never intends for us to uh, not be able to supply and do the right thing with our finances. Uh, but the Lord does give us opportunity to steward those. And we talked a lot about stewardship and the importance of stewardship. Last week, we really kind of began to talk about the importance of how to have some, some forward progress in our finances and how we are able to do it to really bring honor and glory to God. And the step, first step that we want to challenge each and every one of you to do is to save uh, have an emergency fund to, because emergencies are going to happen. Things are constantly going to creep up. I remember the first time we had to use our emergency fund is when I realized that tires wear out and you got to buy new ones every now and then, you know? And I was like, oh, okay, need to plan for that better next time. So then I began to plan for it. But then we had that money there. And the emergency fund, the main goal of that is, is to stop future debt. Uh, because if you know how to manage your money, but you don't have any extra money when an emergency comes, you have to put on a credit card or you have to pay for it some other way by taking a loan. And the next thing you know, you have found yourself back in another debt. And that's not a good thing to do. So emergency fund is a great starting point. Most of your big emergencies are not going to be much more than that. You may have, uh, you know, a tornado come through and you may have a deductible of $2,000 and all you have is 1000 But for the most part, when you need tires and you need a, a, a car breaks down, you need a repair, all that type of stuff is typically going to be less than $1,000. Maybe a leak in the house and you need a plumber to come out and fix it. Those aren't too bad. And you want to make sure that you're doing the best you can. The Bible says in Proverbs 10, 4, He becometh poor that dealeth with a slack hand. If we are just slack, if we are just to the place where... All we do is uh, are very lazy or lackadaisical in our approach or we relax the hand and we don't do things uh, as diligent as we should, then that leads to poverty. That leads to a lack even in our finances. So uh, we want to save $1,000. Does anybody remember what our second goal was that we talked about? Once you have $1,000 savings, what's the next step that we want to move towards? Get out of debt. That is 100% right. We want to get ourselves to a place that we are out of debt because in debt, we are slave. Now, we talked about two different types of debt, short-term and long-term. Uh, the way I like to break it down this way is a long-term debt would be of like a loan, a house loan, something along that lines, where short-term debt is more like I'm borrowing something, okay? When you take a credit card, uh, you are borrowing from that credit card company that money for 30 days. If you don't pay it back in 30 days, now you become slave to it because finance charges are added to it and it makes it almost exceedingly difficult to ever get out of that. Uh, so that's the difference between a borrow and a loan. We got a set agreement. We know how much it is every month. We know uh, what it's going to entail. We know how many years it's going to last. That is the idea of a loan. But you want to desire to get out of every opportunity of any type of overarching financial debt. Now, I shared with you guys, I had several, several thousand dollars of debt uh, when my wife and I first uh, was married and the first few years of our life. And I may actually have, let me see here, to kind of give you a breakdown because I think I broke down how all of it, uh, all of it was. Let me see here. Okay, here it is. So, oh, I don't have how much it was. It was a total of $27,181 uh, that we had in debt. And over the course of that time, it was things like Chase Credit Card Company. It was my Elantra. It was a Discover card. It was my student loans, Miss Kimberly's student loans, uh, the tractor supply you know, department store card where I had bought a trailer or something like that. And, and then Mrs. Kimberly's town and country car. And this was all debt that we had accumulated over the years 
that had surmised up to some $27,000. And we were very locked in. You imagine if you're paying 100 bucks here and 150 bucks here every month and then 300 for this car and 200 for this car and $70 for this loan and $70 for this loan. All the money that you've got that God supplies for you that you may be burdened to do something for missions with, it's tied up paying Capital One and Citibank and all these other places. Or maybe you want to do something special for God and you want to you want to host something and you think, well, financially, I don't have enough money to, to host a cottage prayer meeting and provide some snacks for some people because I'm on such a tight budget. And a lot of that reason is because we are slave to the debt that we've incurred, okay? Um, now, does anybody have credit card debt here? You can be honest. It's okay. Okay. Good. All right. Credit card debt. Some of us have credit card debt. Uh, how about a car loan? Anybody a car loan? Oh, praise the Lord. That's a good thing there. Um, the uh, student loans, anybody? No student loans? You got student loans, okay? So, so all of these things are going to be naturally occurring debt that we'll have and that you'll eventually pay off. Now, let me ask you, school loan, right? Uh, how many years have you been on school? Four years, okay? So a lot of people, uh, they'll even have the way they plan out school loans. If you have a school loan, you can be paying on it for the next 20 or 25 years even. Uh, and uh, in, in a ways, it's not very fiscally, you know, financially responsible because it, 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 they pan it out over such a long period of time. It is a much lower interest, but, but it, it's, it really locks in what you can do because you have a dedicated monthly payment and you don't have the freedom that is there. So it's super important to desire to get out. And if you start to tackle it, we talked about doing it by behavior modification. What did that mean? Stop hanging around the people that spend money. Stop hanging around the people that spend money and to when you're paying off your debt, what debt do you start with? Small. The smallest debt that you have. Because again, you want to you want to get excited. You want to continue going forward. Imagine maybe you were uh, my wife she will every now and then do little things to manage maybe what her weight is or, or eating a lot healthy and things like that. Imagine if you, somebody went on a diet and for three years did everything that they needed to to lose weight and they didn't lose a single pound and all the weight dropped right at three years. That would seem like, why would I even want to get there? You know, with something like a diet, you want to see some progress. Every week, you want to see two or three pounds. Every week, you want to see two. Because that motivates you to keep going, right? And when you pay them little debts off and those little debts off and those little debts off and those little debts off, that's going to motivate you to keep going. Like, man, this is fun. This is great. We're getting these debt paid down. We're using the money that we were locked up, paying a monthly payment on this debt. Now we can add it to this debt. And it allows us to kind of grow our ability. So one of those last debts... We freed up the most money out of all these debts on their monthly payments. Now we're able to pull that in together to pay off this big debt, which helps speed that process along as well. So uh, that's, that's using that step of, of doing so because the Bible very much commands us to owe no man anything. Romans 13, 8. Owe no man anything. But to love one another, for the love, uh, for he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now, if you are diligent at this, uh, this may take you a year and a half to two years. Some people is a little bit faster. Some people is a little slower. It depends on the intensity that you have going forward in, in doing that. Step three we talked about last week. Does anybody remember that? Increase your savings for six months worth of bills. And yep, so you already have $1,000 that you've saved up, emergency fund. But you know what? Say you get hurt and you can't work at the cabinet company for six months until your back mends up. That's going to lead a lot of financial problems, right? So that $1,000 ain't going to cover it either. So what you want to ultimately do is continue to save up so you have enough money that if you bust up your knee and you have to be off your feet for three months, you still have security. You still got some comfort. Now, the reason we do this after getting out of debt is because the debt limits you from getting that much savings. Uh, plus, you know, if you remove the debt, there's a good chance you could live off of maybe a third less of a monthly allowance than what you would with all the debt. For example, say you have $1,000 each month that you pay, whether it's to the car, to 
a, a credit card company to a student loan, and all that money is put together in one particular time. You, you have all of that put together into one, one thing. If you didn't have to pay that on a month-to-month -month basis, you don't need as much money saved up for an emergency. So if you normally spend $4,000 a month in your budget, and a thousand of it is a car payment, you know, credit cards, um, student loans, you know, you got all that stuff tied up in there. If that's paid off, then now you can live off of $3,000 a month, not 4,000. So that's why you want to pay the debt down and then you're living on a lower cost and you want to get to a place where you're able to save three to six months, preferably the six months in an emergency fund. You want to keep this money handy. You want to keep this money in a place where, where maybe it can earn some interest, but you can get it relatively quickly. I shared with you guys last week how um, I keep mine into a, a uh, online bank that yields a little higher interest from a credible company like American Express. It, 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 that one yields me about 40 times more than my region's bank savings account. So they're, they're, they have different options there, and that allows you to get the money in just a few short days because the reality is things like that um, will happen. Emergencies will happen. We've got a family in our church right now that uh, he needs a back surgery and she needs a shoulder replacement, okay? And uh, they got to take turns who has the surgery because they can't really get to a place where both of them are out work for a period of time. I mean, could you imagine being in such pain that you need to have back surgery and can't have it? You know, but if you have money set aside, and I don't know if that's necessarily the factor there or not for them, but if you had the money set aside, that wouldn't be a factor to have to worry about because you knew I could get the help, I could recover the way I need to recover for that. So that requires us budgeting, and that's what we're going to talk about for just a, a few short moments here to make sure that you understand that budgeting. Does, it, does everyone still have a budget sheet from last time? The Bowman, I can't remember if I gave you I one. I have one, but I'm not with me. Okay, that's fine. I got that for you. You got your drink? Okay. So I wanted to use this as an example. Can everyone see this up here? This is the same budget sheet that you guys have going on. Mm -hmm. So imagine if somebody is making $1,000 a week, okay? Just $1,000 a week. Now, you have to understand, if you are a regular employee, your taxes are already coming out. That's easy. Now, if you're a W or a 1099, you need to make you need to make plans to be putting some money in savings from every single paycheck because at the end of the year, you're gonna if you make a thousand dollars a week, there's a good chance you're gonna need about nine thousand dollars at the end of the year to pay in taxes. So because taxes don't come out of a 1099 employee till the end of the year, so you have to you have to know that you know what type of employee that you are. But say you're, 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 this is where you are, you, you make $4,000 uh, as, as, for example, a W-2 employee, okay? So you start off in the first category, and that's going to be the one in the upper right-hand side of your, or the upper left-hand side of your sheet, and that's going to be your given. And, and your sheet kind of flows like this. This is your first priorities, this is your second priorities, this is your third priorities, and these are your fourth priorities. The number one thing on the sheet is your giving. Because to me, when you honor God, the Bible says he will honor you. Yeah. And you want to honor the Lord first. So right there, very simple. You're putting $400 in your tithe because you've just made $4,000 for the month, right? You're making $1,000 a week. You know, most of your months have four weeks in it. So that right there, you're, you're giving the Lord the 10% tithe. But say you want to give a little bit to missions and say you want to give a little bit to a love offering. We put some goals here to help you know. You've got to be at minimum of 10%. Right here, that would be about 12% of your, of your. So you kind of know you're in the good balanced portion of your giving. You're giving what God requires plus maybe a little bit more. Now here, there's no savings whatsoever. Some people... Uh, need to use this. For example, I am a pastor. I'm a 1099 employee. There's no taxes taken out. The church just writes me a check for a certain amount each week. And then at the end of the year, I have to claim all of that money as income and pay self-employment tax on it. So for a regular payroll employee, that's very beneficial for you guys because that 16.9% taxes get split. The employer pays for half of them you get the other half taken out of your, your, um, your taxes. 
But for me, I've got to pay all 16.9% of those taxes at the end of the year. So what I do every single month, I know if I got $4,000 or $1,000 each week uh, that I'm making, $4,000 in a month, then I need to be setting aside about $700 every month that I put into my savings. So when it comes to the end of the year and I have to do my taxes with Uncle Sam, then now all of a sudden I'm actually saying, okay, I have the money to pay Uncle Sam. And I'll have to go to some payment plan or pay interest on Uncle Sam as well. Because it's something that you know it's happening. You can plan for things in your monthly budget. You just got to know what's coming. For example, I've, I've shared with this, this story before. And there's later on in this uh, a place to save for Christmas. Uh, every Thanksgiving, I used to kind of like just get shocked because I realized my wife's going shopping tomorrow. We don't have the money to go shopping with, you know. Put on the charge card. That was always our answer there. And so we started budgeting just a little bit out of every monthly paycheck, every monthly uh, income, every monthly budget, a little bit aside for Christmas. We know how much we would spend on each kid. We know what we would have kind of planning for the rest of the family. And that was it. And if she wanted to spend more on her mom and dad and, and maybe less on folks that were a little bit further away in, the, in their family, then that was her business. We could do that. But we had a plan to do it because we knew that that pill was coming. Uh, so you want to make those plans there. And, and that's where it helps. Maybe you are on the goal where you're trying to get to a $1,000 emergency fund. That's where you're going to want to put like an extra $100 in that particular budget to make it work. Okay? And, and that will help you. So when you start to write this down, you're going to find out you're going to want to do this in pencil. <laughs> because there's going to be some things that you erase, things that you change. But I want you to understand that these goals of what you are spending, these goals are actually really important for you because it helps you to know, oh, wait a second, I'm kind of living outside my budget a little bit here. You know, one of the greatest things you can do to help manage your money is to act your wage and, and not live outside of the means. If I am trying to live a Mercedes lifestyle and I can only afford, afford a Civic lifestyle, then I need to make a change, right? You know, um, so that that's the understanding that's there. And we'll talk a little bit more about retirement in college in just a moment. Um, rent. Here's a here's a great example. There, um, first mortgage, a thousand dollars. So say somebody has a mortgage or the rent they're paying every single month, and it's a thousand dollars. If they are making four thousand dollars a month, and they're paying a thousand dollars out a month towards a home, that's about twenty five percent of their monthly income. And that is within the realm of 25 to 30%. That, so if, if you aren't, so the problem is if you can't change very easily what you're making, but you have to try to find ways to lower what you're spending in order to do that. Uh, if um, the, the five bedroom house that's 5,000 square foot is too much, then maybe we go a three bedroom, two, two bath house that's 2,000 square foot to make it work for the budget that's in there. Um, so you know what that is. And, and sometimes that, that's why we leave this out. Most of your mortgages will build in your real estate taxes and, and your, your insurance there. So you've got to know what you, a little bit understanding of your finances to make sure they know. Is this being paid or do I need to set a little bit of money aside every single month? Because at the end of the year, Paulding County is going to come looking for $2,000. So you've got to know that there. R and M, these are repair and maintenance. Because guess what's going to happen? Your house is going to get tore up. You know, um, our ceiling here at the church, inside the baptistry, has collapsed. Don't know why, but the entire drywall has just completely collapsed. All the insulation has fallen down in the baptistry, and we're going to get it cleaned up and get it ready because we're getting we're having a baptism Sunday. Uh, but uh, you know, it's a uh, but, you know, things happen. Things just happen for some reason. That bad storm that came through, I opened up the door and I looked out and the downspout was shooting water up instead of water going down the downspout. So that's probably a good fix. It probably just put some blockage in there, something caught in there. But, you know, problems are going to happen every day. You're going to have to get a new mower. You're going to have to, to spend some money on some mulch because the HOA is telling you that your flower bed looks awful. You know, there's certain things that you have to do. And that's a good place in there. For example, we try to put about $20 every month in that repair and maintenance fund because there's times where uh, at our house, the, the fake 
stone siding that we have has fallen off. So we've got to buy the right material to be able to put it back on and, and fix it. And, and uh, so, so problems happen. Some people have pest control. Some people need lawn care. Maybe they have somebody come and mow their grass for them. As long as you're fitting all of that stuff within about 20 to 30% of your monthly income, you are in a good place. And that helps you to know if you're in a good place there as well. There's utilities and, and other things there that you'll have to look at. And you just got to look and say, you know, I can't afford anything past this line because I'm spending too much on the things in front of me. And there's going to be some times where you're going to have to make some hard decisions in order for you to stay in your balance and work on whatever you're working on. Whether it's paying off debt, whether it's saving for three to six months, I am doing whatever I can. You know what? Your little girl is going to need clothes. It's going to happen, you know, and, and it's not one of those things like, oh, I didn't realize they're going to get bigger, you know, I mean, they're going to get bigger. They're going to need new clothes. So these are things that you want to try to plan for. And that's what I wanted to kind of show you guys in doing so. Now, when you get to your end of your budget, you're going to be able to see my total expenses is $3,900 and some change. I'm about $50. I'm spending $50 less than my income of $4,000. So what am I going to do with that extra $52? Yeah, it depends on where you're at. If you got debt to pay off, you pay off debt. If you don't have debt to pay off, it goes to the next step, which is um, uh, three to six months savings. So that way you have a fully funded emergency fund. But you've got to be very intentional because very easily you can say, well, man, I want to go out to eat and, and I need to get me some long-term care insurance and I need some sitters and, and I got child support and, and, and I got to replace my furniture. And boy, listen here, I need to have 50, 60 bucks a month and blow money. You know, you go through all your budget and now you have nothing left over and you've not worked on anything for that month. You always want to try to show progress to whatever step you're in. Step one, emergency fund, $1,000. Step two, get all your short-term debt paid off. Step three, save for three to six months. And that's how this budget will help you, you go through that, okay? It'll help you set some goals. Ultimately, your very last category, which will be uh, car payments, debts, credit cards, student loans, all that stuff. Ultimately, you want to get to a place where your goal is zero. It's gone. Paid off. And once it's gone and paid off, then you can start working on some of those other goals that you have. Does that make sense? Yeah. Anybody, any questions that, that, in that area? What do you mean about other goals? Whatever goal, whatever step you're working on. Okay. So, so after, after your debt zero, then your next step is going to be that three to six months savings in case you get injured or something happens to you. After you have three to six months saved up, and this is the step four, I want you to write this down. Step four, you have to begin investing your income. And the goal is 15%. You want to invest 15%. Now grab your Bible and turn it to wood to 1 Timothy 5. All right, 1 Timothy 5, and look what it says down in verse number 8. But if any provide not for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. I remember as a young Christian when I first came across that verse. That really smote my heart. I had a wife at home, wasn't working. She was staying home with two, three, four kids. I can't remember how many we had at the time. And it sat there and thought, like, man, what happened if something happened to me? Uh, what, what plans have we made towards the future? And um, it made me help to realize that God has some expectation of us, especially us men in a lot of ways, to be helpful to provide for our family. And this talks about the investments that we can make. And the reason we talk about this now, not when you're older and you need the investment, is because investment works on the power of time. The longer you invest for, the more beneficial the investment will become. Remember I told you earlier that the average car payment is some $484 per month or something like that. 
And if that was invested every single month into a raw fire wet ray from the age 30 to 70, it would compound to $5.4 million. I mean, I think I could least easily live off retirement with $5 million, right? I have no doubt about that. So, so the length of time that we continually invest is beneficial. So let's just think very quickly. I don't know how good y'all with numbers, but if somebody is making $1,000 a week, if they have paid off all their debt, they have a fully funded three to six month you know, uh, emergency fund, how much should they be saving each week towards retirement? They're making $1,000 a month. How much should they be saving each week? $150. Each month they're saving aside $600. That's like a car payment, right? Or a little bit more than a car payment. It's a couple debt payments, you know? And now that you no longer have the debt, now you can start investing towards your future, okay? And, and because the longer you do it for, the better. Now, uh, many of your employers will offer you special benefits for that. Um, I know when I worked with GNC, my owner would match what we gave uh, up to 3%. So if I set aside 10% of my paycheck every two weeks to go towards a IRA, some type of investment, he would match it up to 3% of that. And that's just free money. So you would want to do that there. The other option is using something like a Roth IRA, which is very good because uh, it is, it is uh, you're dealing with the taxing of money. For example, uh, with a Roth IRA, you're able to make an investment on money and it's taxed now when the money's low. So when you get to pull it out, it's not taxed again. Other investment accounts is you put the money in tax-free, but when you have to pull out all the extra money you've made, then you pay taxes on it. And that oftentimes can remove a lot of your things. So Roth IRAs are great investments as well. So what I always try to do is I'll give, if, if, my employers match at me 3%, I'm gonna give 3% through my company, okay? And then the other 12% of my income, I'm putting into a personal investment account on my own. That's gonna benefit me in my taxing situation. If my boss is not doing anything, then I'm gonna to try to put the maximum amount, 15% that I can in my own personal account to try to benefit those towards the future. But the power is the length of time that we can do that. Albert Einstein said it this way, compound interest is the most powerful force in the world. <laughs> and he's the one that discovered many, many laws of thermodynamics, right? He said compound interest is the most powerful. So the simple time that you put in, the investments you make, makes a huge difference. Ecclesiastes 11, 1 and 2 says, Cast thy bread upon many waters, for thou shalt find it after many days. Give a portion to seven and also to eight. Uh, for thou knowest not what evil shall be upon the earth. So he's saying, cast it out, invest it, and, and, and allow it opportunity to grow and to trust that. So when it comes to investment, and you talk to people about investment, there's different ways to invest. Jeremiah, how old are you? 40. 40. Sis, how old are you? 26. 26. And Brother Bowman and I are some of the older ones here. So the older that you are, or maybe the less time that you've invested, that's the most, that's when you want to be a little bit more aggressive with your investing. I don't really recommend very aggressive investing. I recommend a balance. A little bit moderate, a little bit very conservative, maybe a few things here and there that's a little bit more aggressive, but you don't want a tremendous amount because you don't want to put your money in and the next thing you know, the stock market crash, you don't have anything. You want to have some things that are still trustworthy and are still growing over a period of time. So have a balance in your portfolio as you invest and you get to that particular stage. Let me show you the power of it. If a person was to put just $5,500 a year in a, in a Roth IRA, okay, and they did it from the age 40 to 65, so from your age for the next 25 years, the investment that you would put in money-wise would be about $152,000. But when it was time to retire, you would yield $400,000. You would have put in one hundred and fifty-two, dollars you would get over 400000 
Now you say, well, is that enough money? Well, I want you to think about this. If you're 65 years old, you are now making $1,000 a month through Social Security, and now your Roth IRA is releasing at $1,000 a month for the next 33 years. That's $2,000 a month to live, and think about it, you have no debt. Kids are gone, and, you know, not blowing through money anymore. Uh, hopefully by then your house is paid off and you have no monthly mortgage payment. It's very manageable to live off of $2,000, and that's just by giving even from the age of 40 to 65. So it's never too late, but it's also never too early to start that investment. That makes sense? Questions? Okay. Uh, number five, write this down. If you have children, start saving for college. So I want you to think hypothetically, okay? Um, I make $4,000 a month after I pay off all my bills, all my debts, I give 15% to, to investment, but now I got like this extra 400 bucks still every month. What am I to do with that? Save for college. You know, save for education. Education, they actually have what are called um, education savings accounts that you can put money into those savings accounts. And by doing so, it is actually building interest and helping you towards the goal of adding more money for education at a later time. Um, yes, sir? Didn't you uh, mention uh, maybe beforehand about um, typically most people end up going to college and getting these student loans and they never really finish and never get a degree? Certainly. So how does that play into this save for college? Well, you definitely want to, by you saving for their college education, for your children's education, to me that is one of the greatest gifts that you can give your child because they can still get an education, but they don't have to, um, they don't have to go in debt to get that education. Okay? Education is needed, but sometimes kids may get misguided. And to me, I don't think you put your kid into a national for you institution. I'm going to put my kids in for at least, I'm going to tell them that I'm going to require them to go at least one year into a Bible college and to find out what God's will is for their life before they make the decision on where else they want to step into from that point. But I'm not going to, th you know, and a lot of people that may throw their kids into the University of West or uh, uh, the University of Georgia Tech and become an engineer. That's great. We need good, godly engineers. But let me tell you, four years at Georgia Tech's tuition compared to two years at Chattahoochee Tech, transferring to Georgia Tech for the last two years. So there's a lot of different ways you can manage your money too when it goes to schooling. But your kids need education. You want to strive for them to get education. But you also want to make them work for it and be responsible for it so that way they don't just go to school to have fun and not learn anything and grow and then afterwards have a ton of debt and they can't do anything with themselves. You know what I'm saying? So you got to have the right balance, but this way it allows you to be able to do that so that way you can earn money to help them towards that education process. Um, a young child, uh, let me see if I, I wrote this down here. I did not, um, and I thought I was going to remember it. I'm, I apologize there. But at, at one of those ESA, the education savings accounts, you can start as soon as a child is born in that account and little bit by little bit add to that account. And over time, the longer it compounds, the more beneficial that education account will be. It will grow if you invest into it very moderately. Um, Maybe like the amount, I'm trying to remember what I put in there. I, I pulled up a calculator and I don't have that remember. So anything I would say would probably not write. So please forgive me for that. So, um, but, but be thinking about those steps because those are important things to help with education to the future. Step six, step six. Now remember, you're never going to stop investing your 15%, right? Because that's something you want to do till, till retirement time. As you are making income, you're investing it into your retirement. So it's not like paying out of debt, I'm done with that step, now I go to the next one. You know, when you're investing, you're investing till, till you stop working, okay? And then you're investing some into your ch children's education, yes. But step six is the goal to pay off the home. The goal to pay off the home. 
Now, as you free up extra income, one of the steps to do that is to maybe refinance your home to a 15-year note from a 30-year note. That will dramatically lower your interest rate and allow you to make those payments, more payments to that, that principal in a faster fashion. Again, and paying off the debt early. Uh, you've seen it before. You sign off a house that's worth $150,000, but by the time 30 years pass, you've paid $365,000 for that house. You know, so you don't want to lose that income. You want to make extra payments on that to try to get that out while you're saving for your investment, while you're saving for your kid's education, paying down that, that, um, that balance. And then finally, continue to invest into any type of Roth IRA investments to continue to build your wealth. The Bible says, every man, according as he purposes in his heart, so let him give. Yes, sir. Was that number seven? Yes, sir. Number seven, continue to build wealth. And those are the seven steps that I recommend. Uh, get your $1,000 savings. Uh, get out of debt. Say, finish your emergency fund to, to give you about six months, if you can, of emergency. And just let it sit there. When an emergency comes, you use it and replenish it back to where it needs to be. Um, number f uh, f uh, Let's see. One, two, three, four. Okay. <laughs> Number four, right? You want to start investing, uh, and your goal is to shoot for 15% in your investments and continually doing that until you retire. Number five, save for a college fund to help your young folks, uh, your children, uh, one day. The average college debt is a whopping $37,000. Um, a lot of that debt can be changed by the education processes um, but there's also for example um, I'd like nothing more for my kids to go to a Christian college all four years but the moment I believe all your kids went to a Christian college all four years um, and Christian schools many of them don't accept the same type of federal loans and they want their students to graduate debt-free so they're going to do what they can to work with that student, but at the same time, it's very beneficial and a lot less stress when the parents have also planned for that too. So, so five, college. Number six, pay off the home early if you can. And then number seven, whatever's left over, don't blow it. Invest it. Continue to build wealth for you. So that way, when you get to those golden years or you want to retire maybe a little bit earlier, you're able to do that and enjoy the time that God's given you. Not uh, doing less for the Lord, maybe using that time to do more for the Lord in the latter years of your life. Okay? So the seven steps to victory for you guys. All right? So any other questions? Yes, sir. Okay. So what if, like, uh, you know, uh, what if you want to, like, get some land or something? Or, you know, what, what if you're in the midst of this, but you want, I don't know, something else? You can get whatever you want, but you're going to have to plan for it. If you want to buy land on top of a house, like further away, um, you're going to have to plan for that. But to me, land is not a good investment. You can have, you can have a bunch of land, but um, they're not making it anymore. But land doesn't necessarily automatically give you cash either <laughs> when you hit 65 yeah. um, and in a lot of ways it doesn't build financially it builds some but it doesn't grow financially as much as some of these investment accounts so like I'm just, if you wanted to do that at what point would you do that in there would that be if you wanted to do that I would not do that before um, I would not do that before having your six months savings. If you wanted to include that into your investment portfolio, I don't see that being that big of a problem. But here's what's going to happen most of the time when you buy property is you're going to take a loan to buy the property. Right. And that puts you just in another bad spin back to the beginning. My recommendation would be if you are trying to buy property is to uh, maybe give 10% to your Roth IRA Keep the other 5% back and slowly build your personal wealth yourself till you have enough to buy your property. 
Because if you, if you spend money and pay 4, 5, 6% interest to get property that builds 6% in growth over the year's time, you've not made any money. But if you just put money into an IRA that yields you 5%, then you've made 5%. So either have cash to buy the property, maybe somebody gives you $100,000 because you know, you're on their wheel or something like that. If you want to use that money and invest that in property, I don't see that being a problem. Um, but to me, land is not a better investment than actual money into an investment account. But I would, have your, I would have your savings put together first because you don't want to have a house and some property and then be laid up and can't do anything with it. Any other questions? If you have some personal questions or you want to look at some nitty-gritty, I just want to let you know I'm available to do that. So if you ever want to just sit down and say, all right, here's all my mess. Help me get some order of it. And I've done that before. I've done that before. And it's not always the case, but sometimes the mess is just confusion. I don't have a plan. I'm overwhelmed. Yeah. And, and then sometimes it's some serious you know, decision making. Like, okay, we got to determine what to cut out. You know? and, and I don't mind being a, a mediator to help that. I've done that with several families, several folks before. And uh, I just want to be a help because when God's people are shackled uh, by their finances, it really creates a hindrance for God to get the glory out of their life. And for what God gives to us to go out and be a blessing towards somebody else as well. All right, so I want to thank you all for taking time to be a part of this class. I really enjoyed teaching it. I enjoyed you being here for that as well. Uh, and I just want to thank the Lord for it in prayer. So let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for these students. We thank you for the opportunity to teach on how we can have some victory through our finances. Lord, some just logical steps of what we can do. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to all desire to be uh, fiscally responsible, a good steward of the resources that you've given us. And God, be willing to be a blessing to others around us because of what you've done and what you've given. Now, Father, we do ask for your uh, help, Lord, and wisdom in every one of these that are represented. Lord, that they may make the right decisions with their budget and the right decisions to help them uh, to be uh, freed from their debt, to be freed, financially free, and, and through that, Father, to be redemptive in their relationships. Now, Lord, we love you. We're so very thankful for all that you've done for us, and I pray the blessings uh, that only you can give upon these students here. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you all. Y'all are dismissed. I know a lot of people like to use that, month, that, that property for that investment mentality. And back in the day, when you had to buy property, you could just take it from Indians. That was a great <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> but now property is so expensive, if you don't have property, it's hard to get property. And because what that means is somebody else is making money off the property. So what you would be making on an investment you're already losing because somebody else is making on it. That makes sense? Yeah. But it is something that can be used and transferable over the years. I just spent a long time with my dad yesterday who is increasingly getting ill and uh, had to talk with him about putting a will together and what's happening with all his stuff, you know, when he passes and he wants everyone to have. And that's, that's a difficult subject to have. Um, but he has done some good things in his life, so he has a good bit of finances to be able to make those decisions with. And